Hello and welcome to Survive the Jive. I'd like to discuss the way we go about interpreting myths again, but this time in reference to one specific myth, which is frequently misrepresented by people I believe have uh, ulterior motives in doing so. Um, there are those who seek to justify uh, an aberrant and uh, ahistorical uh, way of life that is uniquely modern in, in many respects by misrepresenting the meaning or the meaning, the claimed meaning of certain myths of the Germanic peoples. So this myth concerns the building of walls or the, the walls around the realm of the gods that is Osgard. Uh, I'll probably pronounce it Asgard because I think that's how it's entered into, you know, Anglophonic speech nowadays. People say As, uh, but the the realm of the Asir, which is the gods, has around it a wall, and it is explained how that wall came to be built in the Elder uh, in the P Prose Edda in a section called Good Beginning, uh, where all the beginnings of all things are explained. Now the more reliably pagan in origin myths are contained in the Elder Edda, the Poetic Edda. And we do have a reference to this myth in here, so we know that it's an old myth. Um, in Vorlespor, verses 25 and 26. Then all the powers went to their thrones of destiny, high holy gods, and deliberated this. Who had mixed the whole sky with mischief, or given Ord's girl to giant's kin. Ord's girl is Freya. Thor alone threw blows there. Bursting with rage, he seldom sits still when he hears such things said. Oaths were trampled, words and assurances, every binding pledge that had passed between. So here we have reference to the potential taking of Freya, that's Ord's girl, by giants or Jurtens as it says in Norse, and the subsequent anger of Thor at the um, trampling of oaths and, and, and assurances. It's a very brief mention, but from that we know exactly which myth in the, po in the prose edda is being referred to. So I'll sum up the myth first and, and talk about the overall meaning. But what I want you to consider as the crucial central part of the meaning of this myth not just from esoteric, but also just an exoteric perspective, is that of a garth or garr. So that's the word in Osgard. Osgard is, is the enclosure of the gods, you can say. Um, now, people sometimes mistakenly confuse, they, they, they translate garth uh, as city because it was often used to describe cities. For example, Constantinople was known by the Norse as Miklagarf, the, and that's translated as great city, which isn't a bad translation, although the word Garthr or guard, as it's anglicized, is, does not mean city, actually. It means an enclosure. But all medieval cities had walls around them, enclosing them, so they, they were, in the Norse sense, a garth. But they, when you see the word, it can apply to a city, but it doesn't exclusively mean cities. And usually it refers to something religious. I think often refers to something in a religious context. So Asgarth is not a city, in my opinion, nor is, for example, the world is called Midgarth, but it, and in Old English as Midanjert. So the Old English cognate of Garthris Yeert. It's an enclosure, a measured out part of space. And what we know from the archaeological record of the temples, as I said in the Anglo-Saxon paganism video, uh, is that they all had this kind of fence around them. You see the same thing with the temple of Uppsala, which is described as having, having had a golden chain around it, and that demarcates the sacred space from the profane space. Uh, which is a, a perspective on religious worldviews uh, elucidated by the scholar of 
all religions, that is Mircea Eliade. I highly recommend you read his work because it helps you to understand this worldview. There are other myths as well where this is important. For example, Frey, the god Ingvi Frey, he woos um, Gerfer, or uh, Gerfer, who uh, his name becomes the modern name Gerda in Swedish or Gerda in German. Um, now this this whole myth needs to be understood in the term of him acquiring the sacred space, like it's. Uh, an, an essential part of their worldview. And even in the beginning of all things, Odin makes the, the world with his brothers uh, by, from the sacrificed giant, uh, Ymir, and by killing this Jotun, and, bathe, and the blood drowns most of the other Jotuns, and then by removing the previously dominant Jotuns from the, from the cosmos, it opens the path up for the, the, an era of the gods and of men, uh, a new age, which we currently dwell in. But the, the three brothers are called Odin, which is like f divine frenzy, that means. Vili, meaning will, as in will power, and V, which is cognate with Old English, Weo, which is the sacred space. It can mean an idol or usually a sacred space. So you can see it as meaning that the, fun the three features the three elements that needed to be in place for the foundation of a holy order and a new age were willpower, the, the divine frenzy, and sacred space enclosed. Um, so, once you understand the sacred significance of the term gard or garther, uh, this, or yerd, the same word really, is all, then you can understand the significance of these walls being built around Osgard, Os Osgard, um, Asgard. So the myth in question is, as outlined in Gil's beginning in the Prose Edda, takes place early in the history of the cosmos after creation, and Asgard uh, does not currently have walls, yet it needs to be protected from the threat of invasion from Jotnar. Giant isn't necessarily a good translation of Jotun. I think it was Jackson Crawford who used the term anti-god as a, a translation. In many of the European religions, the gods uh, have an adversarial race who are very similar to them in all respects, uh, against whom they're fighting for various reasons, competing over resources. Uh, this likely re reflects an original component of Indo-European religion, which in Germanic religion manifests as a Jotun uh, os uh, dichotomy. But anti-god makes sense because they share similar powers, both the gods and the Jotnar, they have, you know, a divine wisdom. They have wisdom or from primordial times, and the Jotnar are primordial. In fact, you know, they may precede the gods. Uh, it is only from the body of a Jotun that Odin and his brothers are able to create the ordered cosmos. So the Jotnar are in some respect part of the pre-ordered chaos of the, of the uh, initial primordial uh, universe. Uh, so they are certainly powerful and formidable enemies of the gods. Um, and in many ways they are the same as gods. They appear to be equivalent in power. Um, and some of the gods, such as Loki and Thor, are themselves of Jotun descent. So, but it doesn't seem any of the Jotuns are of god descent, um, with the exception of those that descend from Loki. Uh, who, which may, and there's some question as to what part of Loki's ancestry is uh, from the Os Asir, uh, since uh, it is known he's part Jotun. But anyway, they need to protect themselves, and in this sense, the Garth, the Gard enclosure, is a protective military fortification that needs to be built around Asgard, which is an enclosure without military fortifications. Um, 
to protect the people there within, the gods within. Uh, but they are discussing how to build it. It's a big, a great work that needs to be done. Just as they're discussing it, they are approached by a mysterious figure who does not identify himself, who offers to build the walls for them in just three seasons, uh, which would be fantastic for the gods. He asks, however, a price which is far too high for anyone to agree to pay. Yet the gods agree to his terms because he says he will accept, no, he will not have to pay them a thing if he fails to complete it within three seasons. They consider that it is impossible for this individual to complete the work in such a short time. And so even though it is impossible for them to honor that deal, uh, they can accept it. They could not possibly honor the deal because it required that he was given the sun, the moon, and the hand in marriage of the goddess Freya. Now, all three of these things are essential for the functioning of the ordered cosmos. They cannot be, they cannot do without them. There existed in the Norse psyche an anxiety about the vulnerability of the sun and the moon, as is evident from the myth of Ragnarok. Uh, when the sun and moon will be swallowed by the wolf, Fenrir, who is Loki's son. And uh, these are themselves associated with deities. When those disappear, that marks the end of the world and the twilight of the gods, you know, the Gotterdammerung in the German, they say. Uh, the, this is what Ragnarok is about, the end of the world and the end of the rule of order, the established rule of the gods. And that will occur when these things happen and the Giants are trying, the Jotnar are trying to bring this about. Uh, they are the enemies of the gods. Now, they did not know it at the time, but this individual was himself a Jotn, and that explains why he wanted to bring this about. Uh, they might not have agreed to the terms if they'd known he was a Jotn, but they agreed to them. The third thing he wanted, the, uh, the hand in marriage of Freya, is very much in the same category of, as the first two requirements because, as I've explained in other videos, uh, which you need to watch because I'm not going to go over it again here, I believe Freya was the Norse equivalent of the Indo-European Dawn Goddess and uh, there is an obvious Germanic equivalent in German and English sources called Ostara or Estra, who is absent from North Germanic sources for some reason but who does seem to correspond quite closely to Freya and many of Freya's other mythological aspects are very clearly in line with those of other Indo-European goddesses of the dawn, namely like her sexual, uh, alluring uh, and somewhat um, transgressive aspects and the, uh, the association of uh, her, her precious gold necklace, uh, the gold and amber being associated with the dawn goddess, um, her te cries, tears of gold perhaps, or amber, and um, her being kidnapped as well is another one. And of course, here we have Freya being threatened with kidnapping. I know it says marriage, but please remember also, if you see my other videos, the very word wed itself comes from an Indo-European word, which means to kidnap. And the notions of kidnapping and uh, marriage were very, very closely associated in Indo-European culture. The Indo-Europeans would take, literally take, kidnap wives from other peoples uh, and, and take them back with them. And this manifests not only as, as a desire to take the women of other people, but also uh, an anxiety that your own women will be taken by enemy peoples. Uh, and that manifests here in an exoteric sense uh, among the gods. However, esoterically, uh, she is the dawn. She is the radiant dawn. She is the coming of spring. And you know, like the taking of the sun and the moon, it would mean the removal of the ordered cosmos, the end of the ordered cosmos, the end of the world, if she was to be lost. So obviously they can't possibly agree to it. Uh, it's not a, a, an honorable deal, uh, which the gods should be expected to uh, honor. It's an unreasonable and evil proposition, um, an indecent proposal, but, uh, they accept it because they just don't think it can possibly be done. However, this crafty individual also negotiates that he shall be allowed the use of the god stallion Svadalfari, 
and that stallion enables him to complete the work in record time and the gods are dismayed to see that he can cart huge loads of um, rocks from the quarry uh, with the aid of their stallion and it looks like he will easily complete the walls within the three seasons which would of course mean disaster for the gods. So they call upon Loki, Loki Laufison, uh, who at that stage is not an enemy of the gods. He is one of the gods uh, at that earlier stage in the chronology of, of the, the gods' myths. And since he was responsible for this, this deal in the first place, this problematic deal, he would have to come up with the solution. And that is a common pattern in the, early, in the myths of the earlier part of the chronology, uh, before Loki is banished to hell to be um, punished there. Uh, until Ragnarok for his misdeeds. But here he solves the problem that he created and uh, takes the form of a mare and then distracts the stallion's Fadalfari sufficiently that uh, the mysterious figure is unable to complete the work in time and he doesn't therefore get what he uh, his side of the deal. And um, as a result, he becomes very angry and his disguise slips and the gods realize he is a Jurten, an enemy within the gates. And uh, they call upon Thor, who, having been battling giants in the east, comes to Asgard and smashes the skull of this uh, mischievous Jurten with his hammer Mjolnir. And uh, that would mean peace and order. There is another part of the story, though. When distracting the stallion Svadalfari, it mated with Loki, who was in the form of a mare, such that he became pregnant with a foal, and that foal became, was born, and it was the fastest horse ever. It had eight legs, which symbolize its exceptional speed. And the, this young foal stallion was called Sleipnir, and it was given by Loki as a gift to Odin. The problem that I and other faithful pagans have with the way that certain modernistic people have chosen to interpret uh, and misinterpret this myth is that they focus on the gods as being oath breakers. They see that they argue that their gods did not uphold their side of the bargain and therefore are oath breakers and in the Germanic culture being an oath breaker is a terrible thing. But did the gods actually break any oath? Uh, the deal was that they, he would have to, this giant would have to complete the work within that time and he failed to complete it. There was nothing in there that stipulated that they couldn't prevent him from doing so. And anyway, the original terms of the deal were such that they would result in the death of uh, all order in the, in the cosmos and that would be wrong. That would be categorically wrong. Uh, they could not allow the destruction of order in favour of chaos. That is what the gods look, exist for. They are the good, they are the order. So they would not have been capable of honouring the deal because it would be to cease being gods, since the gods are good. It was the builder who deceived the gods by hiding his true identity. He was the deceptive one in this deal, not the gods. And his ultimate intention was to destroy them. So there was no honour in his side of the deal. His intentions were duplicitous and deceitful. Not those of the gods. Then there is another problem. The sorts of people who have made these arguments want to turn the entire mythos and the morality that they're in on its head and make the gods the baddies and the Jotnar the goodies. If you were to accept that premise, it would render the entire mythology incoherent. There would be no ethical standard within it. Um, but there is a strong desire among some people to worship the Jotnar above the gods. I disagree very strongly with these people, and I think they've been misguided. Um, some of them, I think, do so quite innocently. They've been misled, uh, and I try to dis persuade them otherwise. But I think others are fully aware that they are agents of chaos, and that they are promoting a chaotic worldview in 
which is the spirit of the age we now live in, because they don't want to see a re-establishment of divine order in any respect because they're against it. And it's these same kinds of people who also misinterpret another part of the myth, which is Loki's role. Uh, they sympathize with Loki above the other gods, these kinds of people, because they identify him as an, an other and a transgressive person who fails to uphold the values of order. And they themselves are transgressive against the eternal laws of nature and of the gods. So they identify with Loki for all the wrong reasons, uh, not for any of the nobler aspects of his character that do exist in the earlier myths of the chronology, but more for his overall character as an enemy of the gods. Uh, it's highly transgressive. And these kind of people will often identify with some kind of um, LGBT thing, one of these like letters uh, of the modern ideology uh, of, of gender and sexuality, uh, which is so popular at the moment um, for various reasons. They will argue that Loki turning himself into a female horse and becoming impregnated uh, is evidence that he is either a homosexual or a transgender or someone who would literally, in a literal sense, transgender means to change gender. And in that sense, unlike the people who call themselves transgender, Loki really is transgender because he actually changed his genders. Literally, he transformed from a male being into a female being and then back into a male being, which is something a uh, mortal can't do. Uh, so, but when they mean transgender, they don't, they don't just mean literally change gender. They mean uh, conform to this modern ideology of, uh, of identification with the outward signs of, a, of gender within a culture. Uh, that, that, and, and they equate that to a metaphysical transformation from you know, spiritually male to spiritually female or something like that. But uh, that's not what's happening at all. And um, as for the homosexual, which is you know, he, someone who's actively attracted to someone of the same gender, well, that doesn't quite work either because he's, he hasn't, uh, it's an animal for a start. He doesn't seek out sex with animals in any other myth. He doesn't seek out uh, homosexual activities, uh, as far as we can see in the surviving mythos. Uh, and here, he doesn't seem to have planned to have had sex with the stallion. His intention is very clearly noble, which is to amend, and, uh, amend the wrong that he has done, to atone for it through right action, after having done wrong, a wrong, something wrong against his people, against his kin, the gods. To whom he is uh, for whom he is responsible, uh, and so he does his duty. He does his duty and uh, finds a way to save the gods uh, and and the and order itself, the order of the cosmos, from certain destruction, the loss of the sun, the moon, and Freya, by distracting the stallion that is building the walls too quickly, for for the benefit of the Odins, uh, and in so doing he saves them from this certain destruction and also ends with the result that they've got the walls and also Odin has a new horse which is faster than any other and this horse is unlike Loki's other children which become enemies of the gods is never an enemy of the gods. Sleipnir is always an asset to the gods and to Odin specifically. Now there's also all kinds of ancient Indo-European uh, symbology in the horse sex things mating with a horse that I've gone into a whole video on about the ancient in the European horse sacrifice, which has very close ties to the sun. Uh, again, we're, we're seeing a solar myth, like this, the, the horse, which is uh, sac sacrificed after having been raped, represents the sun. So it's unclear how, that's in the original Indo-European myths from thousands of years ago, which we can see carried on. Even in Bronze Age Sweden, they had this kind of a horse sacrifice and there's depictions of people uh, raping horses. So I think that you're, what we're seeing in this myth here is some continuation of that. And that ties in with the solar significance of this myth, where the giants are threatening the integrity of the sun and of the moon and of uh, 
the rising dawn goddess. So it's all this, you know, the cosmos itself that is threatened by the Jotnar. What moral role can we see from Loki in this? He is performing his duty as a god to his kinsfolk, the gods, the Asir. Uh, what are his sexual intentions? It doesn't say whether he, in, he, whether he intended that, whether he had a plot all along. You could infer that because he's a crafty trickster, he intended all along to uh, have sex with the stallion. That's not indicated at all in the text. But let's say you accept that. Well, if it was his plan to become impregnated and give birth to a horse that would aid the gods, then obviously he hasn't uh, in any way become an anti-god in that intention because he wants to help the gods by providing the sleep near. He wants to help the gods also by distracting Sarofari from his work. So everything is virtuous in his decision to do this. Although becoming a female animal, even if he hadn't mated with a, a male animal, but even becoming a female animal was an act associated with great nith, that is shame, because of the associated ergi, that is unmanliness. Uh, any homosexual activity or anything remotely unmanly would be ergi, and that would be associated with a great deal of uh, the social burden of shame in a shame culture. Very heavy. A great sacrifice to make. That's the meaning of, the, of, of Loki's behavior in this myth, that Loki had to make a sacrifice. His reputation was seriously harmed by his unmanliness here. It's just like in the myth Thrymskvitha, in which Thor has to dress as a woman, as Freya, to, for her benefit and for the benefit of all the gods, so that he can attack the giants, the Jotnar. He takes upon himself the great shame of unmanliness because he must perform his duty to his people, the gods, in fighting against their enemies at any cost, including to bring shame upon himself and uh, the meaning of, is very clear because within that culture, unlike our own, the greatest shame was unmanliness. Uh, shame was such a concern. Neath is so, even if you go to their equivalent of hell, what they call hell as well, the, the being, the serpent in hell that hurts you is called the shame striker, Neath Hugr, because shame is something that carries, carries right down in, into the afterlife, in the underworld. Shame is the worst thing, but it's not as bad as failing to perform your duties to your people. Uh, that carries a greater shame even than unmanliness. Now you can understand what the meaning of Thor doing that was, what the meaning of Loki doing that was. It was to demonstrate that even the horrible shame of unmanliness, Ergi, is not so great that you shouldn't be willing to take it on to yourself for the good of your people when the time comes. Therefore, the morals within this myth aren't so complicated or nuanced as people like to pretend. There's a very clear message, exoteric message. Honour your people, perform the duties that you have for them as best you can. And what were the lessons of the gods here, these divine personalities? Well, they found a way to do what Donald Trump failed to do, which is he said he was going to build a wall and have the other side pay for it. Well, that's what the gods did. They had the Jotun pay for it. Um, and that's okay because they are enemies of order. And so their responsibilities to the Jotun are, are not the same as those to their kinsfolk. They have uh, the law of their kin and they have to honour those oaths that are made, but it's not quite the same when you make it to an enemy, especially when the ultimate result is the elimination of all order and of your people or gods, you know, in this context. Um, now, sometimes metaphysically, some people may say this is also a problematic myth because how can the how come the gods didn't just click their fingers and make the wall be there you know that's a good question like if odin can breathe life into mankind if he can fashion the entire world from the bodies of Jotna, why can't he just click his fingers and make this uh, wall be there 
uh, or any of the other gods for that matter. Why did they need a wall in the first place? If, as I said, the worlds are demarcated according to a sacred cosmology, you know, you have nine worlds, each one properly demarcated, uh, just as we demarcate sacred space from profane space on Earth. Why should extra walls be needed, you know? There's this kind of thing like it shows that the gods are flawed somehow and therefore it, it means that they aren't gods. But simply put, that we believe in the gods. They are real, divine personalities. Beyond our entire comprehension as mortal beings, but we are able to understand a part of them most effectively through the myths, which are true, but which may not have occurred in the sense that occurrences are things that manifest within the space and time that we experience as mortal beings. These events, which we call myths, take place outside of space and time. The gods apparently didn't have time to build the walls themselves because of the urgent need to have them built soon because of an enemy threat. That doesn't really properly make sense metaphysically. Unless you understand that the myths are symbolic of truths, of actual truths. So the function of the myth is to impart wisdom from the divine to the mortal realm. Uh, and, and, and that's how you should regard it. What is the, what is the wisdom within this myth? Uh, there is an esoteric dimension and there's an exoteric one. The exoteric one is not hard to understand, as despite people deliberately trying to mis, uh, misrepresent what, what's in there. But uh, I think the esoteric ones in this one are not particularly difficult to approach either. It's about order versus chaos. We ourselves enter into mythic time and space, that same time and space that the myths occur in, during ritual. Indo-European rituals, as they survive to us, are very, very concerned with the demarcation and measuring out of space, sacred space. A good example is the fire ritual to Agni, which is preserved in the Rig Veda, and which is still maintained in parts of India to this day. You can see a great documentary on it on YouTube called The Altar of Fire. The entire ritual is just the building of a temple and then burning it down again. But the temple has to be built according to the most meticulous measurements. And that begins with demarcating the sacred space. And the measurements have to be exact. Sacred space was crucial, as I've explained, in Germanic religion too. We can see that all the temples had these demarcations, the concept of the Yeart in Old English, or Garthr in Old Norse, the guard, Asgard. Now, this is a myth about that sacred enclosure, and we understand the importance of that when we enter a ritual space, which is demarcated before ritual begins. Then we also enter ritual time. And it's only in ritual time that the creative events can take place. The events of Gulf beginning in which this myth takes place. For example, all the creative acts of the gods take place within this ritual time, this mythic time. We participate in this, this divine action of creativity when we perform the sacrifice. Odin, Vili and Vi perform the first sacrifice of Ymir, and in so doing, create our world. We share in that creation when we share in ritual time and space. So don't try to apply the profane laws of physics to uh, the mythic space and time. Part of the reason I'm doing this video is because I received a letter from the registered charity, the Odinist Fellowship, of which I'm a member, a charity in the UK which speaks out for the rights of heathens in the United Kingdom. And the author elucidated all these points regarding the true meaning of this myth. And I think it's very important he did so because he himself has identified the 
perhaps unwholesome and uh, corrupting influence of those who wish to pervert our myths. And um, I'm going to read a bit from his letter just so, so you understand uh, why I, was, I felt moved to, to, to communicate some of these things. Those who sit in judgment upon the gods, something that no mortal should do, and accuse them of wrongdoing or worse, have failed to pay due attention to what was going on in the myth. If that oath was broken, it was justifiable to do so, seeing as the consequence of abiding by the oath are so extreme and involve the destruction of all creation. To avoid that, surely anything is justified. That, at least, is my human reasoning. However, the gods, the sacrosanct gods, are incapable of committing perjury or sacrilege. Finally, we need to consider the role of Thor in this myth. He acts as the saviour of Asgard, returning from far away as soon as he is summoned to deal with the foe, and by the same token he merits the subriquet of mankind's defender. Thor is utterly single-minded in his determination to stamp out the Jotun menace. Thor has no love for them, he does not negotiate with them, nor does he aim to reach compromises with them. He knows instinctively that the giants are opposed to the natural order and thus to the folk, and so he gives them no quarter. In this myth, Thor represents a virtue within mankind, that of a clear and determined strength against the enemy of a people and for one's people. Yet all the gods in this myth act virtuously also, not just Thor. The crafty and, if you wish to say, duplicitous nature of the gods making this deal was all for the same ultimate good to which Thor strives. Although they sought to achieve this through other means, because sometimes brute strength, like Thor represents, is not always the answer. And Loki, who I do not see as an evil figure in these earlier myths, these myths that takes place in Gilfaginning, was trying to achieve the same thing that Thor was trying to achieve, the safety and of, of order of the gods. It's only later that Loki becomes evil. And, um, you know, I've also seen people saying recently that they think Loki was not a god and should not, uh, and he was never worshipped. Half of that's true. There's no evidence of his worship. I don't think he was worshipped exactly, but he was a god. He was seen as a fallen god in a way because he had originally worked with his, even with his problematic and duplicitous nature, his dishonest nature, he worked to the ends of the gods. At first, it's only when he turns against them shame, in the, and the shameful claims of Locusena that he has to be regarded as an enemy of the gods. And for that reason, he isn't worshipped. But he was a god as much as he was a Jotun. Uh, so I think in this myth as well, he has some positive aspects. But that does not mean that the sexual transgression which he has to participate in as a sacrifice is something that we should aspire to or celebrate. Far from it. That is not what the myth is trying to communicate. Sacrifice means giving up something of value. In this case, he, his dignity, his, uh, uh, his reputation, he had, his manliness was sacrificed uh, in, the, in the name of a higher cause, the order of the gods. If Loki is to be admired here, it is only for the sacrifice he made, and not because he represents a role model for people who have alternative sexual preferences. That, again, is a perversion of the myth. Thank you for watching Survive the Jive. I don't normally interpret myths in this way, and I haven't done a very in-depth study here. I've just gone at the surface, and I think that most people can probably perceive everything I've said here already quite intuitively, as long as their hearts are correctly inclined towards the good, towards the gods. It's only through a deliberate effort that people seek to turn the myth myths on their heads and make the good into the evil or uh, try to make a virtue of a vice. Please consider becoming a patron on Subscribestar if you want to have 
a chat with me on the Patreon voice chats where I'll answer your questions personally. At least please click subscribe and share this video and have a look at some of my other videos because I covered so much mythological content, mainly about Germanic and Nordic paganism, but also other kinds, all the Indo-European world is covered. And uh, if you go through some of my content, you'll find some really fascinating stuff. So take the time to do that and I uh, hope you enjoy what you find. I'm Tom Rousel. Keep surviving the jive.